Okay, good morning, everybody. This is Deirdre Brennan. We'll start the member update. We will begin with introductions, as we always do. And we will go first to our service centers. So, Bolingbrook, anybody in Bolingbrook? Doesn't look that way. Okay. And we will go to Burr Ridge. There are many people in Burr Ridge. Would you start, Robin? Robin Wagner, South Holland Public Library. Jessica Barnes, I'm the Special Projects Librarian here at Rails. Stacy Palmasano, Administrative Assistant at Rails. Ryan Hebel, I'm the uh, Senior Support Specialist here at Rails. Nikki Zimmerman, PR and Marketing here at Rails. Deirdre Brennan. Monica Harris, Rails. Ann Slaughter, Director of Technology Services at Rails. Mary Witt, Rails. Layla Heath, Rails. Catherine Yanikoski, Deputy Director of Julia Public Library. Diana Rush, uh, Continuing Education Consulting at Rails. Dan Bostrom, Member Engagement Manager, Rails. Karen Keefe, Hinsdale Public Library. Great, thank you. What about Coal Valley? Angela Campbell, Rock Island. Leanne Bradberg, Andalusia. And Sarah Alexander from Kelowna. <laughs> Kelowna is here too, but she <laughs> stepped out. Thank you. Thank you, East Peoria. Oh, well, we were talking the whole time then? No, I unmuted you. So they can hear me. Okay. Yes, hi. Hi, hi. Uh, Gina Burr, Fond du Lac District Library. <laughs> Mary Lee here from Wyoming. Kendall Harris on RSA Rails. Eric Hawaii on RSA Rails. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, now to some of our other sites. Do we have Aurora? We do not have Aurora. Okay. How about Cherry Valley? Good morning, Jane Lenzer, Director of the Cherry Valley Public Library, and I'm the only one here. All right, hi, Jane. Hi. How about Freeport? Looks dark. Okay. How about the State Library? It's, nobody seems to be there, okay. Kankakee. No. How about LaSalle? There's always people in LaSalle. We can't hear you, LaSalle. Oh. Try it again. I can hear something, but we yeah, we see you, but <laughs> we don't hear you. They're not our end. They have to unmute their, their unit. Can you, can you hear us now? Yes. yes. Great. All right. <laughs> this is Patty Smith, director of Robert Rowe Library. Julie Whalen, Great. Princeton Public Library. Barbara Zeman, Pawpaw Public Library. Lisa Batner, Tisquah Public Library. Terry Sankson, Richard Martino Library. Okay, thank you. See, there's action in Freeport, but we'll give her a bit. Um, let's see. Well, so how about New Linux? Can you hear us? Yeah, but you're dark. We can't see you. Yeah, we're we're gonna have to fix that. But for now, it's Michelle Krozik from New Linux. <laughs> okay. Jamie Lockwood Mantino. <laughs> Noreen Bormit Piatone. Lauren Offerman, Three Rivers. Kathy Bergen, Madison area. And Brian Smith, Rails. Great, thank you. Aurora should be up. Is Aurora, I hear we have Aurora now too? Still no, Sorry, okay, just... nope, we don't. Quincy. I don't see anybody in the room in Quincy. Sterling. Michelle McKelvey yeah. from Walnut Public Library. Great. How about Sycamore? Not hearing you, Sycamore. Uh, Kim, Alberth, you. Kim Alberth at uh, Ella Johnson Library. Great, thank you. How about Freeport? 
We can't hear you, but we see you. You're muted somehow, so why don't you look for your remote and see if you can fix it. <clears throat> okay. All right. I think that's what we that's what we have for now. So um, we'll move on through the agenda to uh, well to uh, Gen General Rails News. Was that you, Freeport? <clears throat> Excuse me. No. Okay. Oh, I should say before I begin, um, as is probably already evident, <laughs> technology is our friend, but sometimes it uh, makes things more complicated. So please bear with us as we as we uh, you know work through these things. And we have a lot of people that are um, connected to us via Zoom, like maybe like most 80 people probably. Um, so we um, are uh, particularly. Uh, uh, specifically, Nikki here uh, will be monitoring the questions and the comments on the chat, so um, she will um, keep us uh, abreast of all of that. Okay, moving on. So, first and foremost, uh, introduce again Monica Harris, our new Associate Executive Director, and she's going to say a few words about herself. Hello all, hi to everyone here at Burridge and of course all the way across uh, Zoom today. Uh, my name is Monica Harris. I am the new Associate Executive Director here at Rails uh, as of just a couple weeks ago. Uh, just a little bit of my background. My background is primarily in public libraries. Uh, I've worked in public libraries for almost 20 years and I've been in Illinois since 2007. I worked at the Oak Park Public Library and the Schaumburg uh, Township District Library in Chicagoland. Uh, but previous to that, I am from Michigan originally uh, and I worked in a variety of libraries, including some very small libraries in Michigan where I'm originally from. Uh, and so my career has kind of spanned uh, the sizes of libraries and, and different experiences, which is one of the reasons that I'm so excited to be here at Rails. Um, so thank you all for the opportunity. I am going to be uh, making my way out to visit some of our other sites and some of our other member libraries over the next few months. And so I hope I get a chance to meet some of you in person and to hear more about your experiences with Rails and libraries here in Illinois. Thank you for the opportunity to introduce myself. All right, thank you. Okay. Um, Moving on, um, I don't have a lot of sort of general news at this point. There's a lot of specific things that are on the agenda. I will just update you about a couple of things. Uh, uh, one is that um, we've been we've been doing um, a few different um, analyses uh, of our delivery services over the past few months. Some of you have probably, no doubt, participated in focus groups at various of our sites. Um, we've been looking at um, the outsourcing versus, you know, insourcing. We've been looking at um, uh, quality of service, as always. We've been looking at uh, possible automation that we might do to make delivery more efficient and, uh, and you know, bring down costs potentially over the years, you know, the years to come. Um, we're, we're these. Uh, analyses aren't completed yet. Um, when they are, we'll certainly make a report to the members. Uh, just wanted you to know that that's ongoing. Um, we're also going to be starting a project here in, in Rails uh, related to um, equity, diversity, and inclusion within our organization. Um, we'll be starting by looking, uh, uh, taking a look at implicit bias and uh, Joe Philippak, who are, is, is our continuing education uh, director, he's, he's sort of uh, spearheading, uh, looking for uh, you know, some consultants, experts to uh, get us started off on this. We wanna be sure that we are the best uh, you know, possible organization that we can be internally, um, and uh, because that helps us help you uh, better more also. Um, so that's, um, that's, that's pretty much the general news, as I say, before we get to the other uh, items on the agenda. Any questions so far? I might have a question okay. for Gail Borden. Okay. I'm not sure. They had their hand up. 
Okay. And so I'm not sure if um, if someone wanted to talk. Um, I will hit. You have a question, Gail Borden? Nope. It says no. Okay. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> All right. Great. Thank you. Uh, okay. Um, next item is uh, talk about the unserved. You, a lot of you who came to the um, member update last time probably remember we had a very lively discussion um, in person and uh, via chat about um, the unserved and the various uh, ways that libraries are are you know offering non-resident cards, et cetera. Um, it became clear that there was a lot of confusion, not um, even more confusion than we thought there was um, about the actual rules related to non-resident cards. For example, yes, you can um, uh, bill people in installments. A lot of people didn't know that. Um, so we uh, we had some discussion with the state library, um, and um, you also may remember that Karen Egan um, made a cameo appearance. Um, to help explain some things that we couldn't explain. So she was experienced firsthand the uh, level of confusion. So um, we are going to be working on a new FAQ with the State Library and with Heartland about um, the, uh, the laws and the rules related to the unserved. Um, we've also put some a lot more information on our website and made it easier to find. There is now, as I'm sure you've noticed, we have these Pulse uh, uh, pages on the on the website, and one of them is about the unserved. So you can go there and get a lot of information. Um, you also, uh, we have a Universal Service Committee of the board, and they had a meeting in November, a very, very good meeting. Um, where there was um, a lot of discussion about um, the confusion and the survey that uh, that we did of libraries getting trying to get a, a sense of what libraries were actually uh, doing to serve the unserved and um, uh, one of the uh, a topic that came up over and over was libraries were giving uh, temporary cards or student cards or teacher cards or they were and these are not um, strictly speaking within the the scope of the law <laughs> so um, but it's obvious that you know libraries are trying to do the right thing and and you know make it work for their communities and so um, had some conversations with uh, uh, Greg McCormick and other state library staff about that and we are looking into what the downside might be to actually you know making those kinds of things actually legal um, like what's why not so um, so I think that is a good a very good step forward we also had a conversation that um, about kids cards and and uh, there was a lot of um, I mean, I'm going to say even enthusiasm from the members of the committee that it was it was we, we were talking about how you know so many libraries are going fine free and that often if they can't go completely fine free they go kid fine free so the suggestion was was made what if we were able to give kids cards to non-residents so we would be able to serve all the non-resident children and uh, there was a lot of interest in that, and and so that's a very uh, specific um, item that we are going to be looking at with the state library. Um, and let's see, what else did I want to say? Um, I know uh, Catherine's going to speak in a, a minute, uh, Catherine Yanikowski, about some things that, that you're doing specifically in Joliet. Um, and maybe you might want to also talk about the school library reciprocal borrowing um, thing that you brought up, because you brought and the uh, and the tax formula. Perhaps would you mind? Absolutely. Okay. Um, let me see. I must put my glasses on. Um, I th yeah, I think that's what I wanted to say about um, 
the unserved. As I say, Catherine has a few more um, points to make. But are there any questions or comments so far from anybody? I'm sure I would down. be surprised if there weren't. <laughs> um, someone's asking where the info on the cards is on the Rails website. Where the info? On I think the cards you were the the library cards you were just talking about. There is information on our website under. It's Actually, the library pulse page is not there yet. Oh. So you have to go under. Pardon me. Okay. No, it's going to be there soon. Pretty soon, we have these library pulse. They deal with different issues. Very soon, there will be one on the unserved, and you'll see that on the home page right at the top. Right now, it's under. We keep. We don't have all the information here to describe. Right. We have like what library cards people have. Is that is that what they want to have to look at? There's nothing there about kids' cards. Not yet. No, there's All we because have there's is like what libraries have that offer non-resident cards, what type of card they have. But pretty soon there will be a lot more information on there. We'll announce it in our e-news, and you'll see it on our homepage. Does that answer the question? Uh, yes, I have another comment. Okay. Um, DeKalb, Cortland, and Malta are almost finished entering into an IGA with our school district to get kids and teacher cards. Uh, it's been really complicated to get legally correct. If we could just give kids cards up to 18, it would be much easier. Yes. So. And Aurora is up. Okay, great. Hello, Aurora. <laughs> um, okay, then I'll turn it over to Catherine. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak about Joliet's unincorporated population and what we're doing to try to address our um, challenges with providing quality reading materials to those on the far east side of Joliet as well as our unincorporated area. Joliet serves uh, 147,000 City of Joliet taxpayers, but we also, within the boundaries of Joliet, have about 82,000 individual properties that are considered Joliet Township, and therefore they pay out of pocket for library cards when and if they can afford it. And one of our challenges and goals at Joliet Public Library has been to increase our access to those residents and to ensure that they find the library accessible. We have 62 square miles in Joliet, and we have two library branches, one in the downtown and one on the very far west side. So our goal has been to reach the east side of Joliet in particular, and currently, we do not have a fully established outreach department at Joliet Public Library, nor a bookmobile. So one of the, the goals that I've been working with the staff on is how to get reading materials into the hands of children and families on the east side when their public libraries, in many cases, I'm sorry, their school libraries, in many cases, do not, they do not really provide sufficient materials. Um, several of our schools do not have libraries in District 86. And in conversations with District 86, the goal has been really to provide access to those books for kids in a way that's convenient for the families. So one of the things that we discussed was providing little pre-libraries throughout the community. I was fortunate to be able to attend a discussion that was provided by University of St. Francis, which is our local university. And in doing so, it was called an on-the-table discussion provided through Chicago Community Trust. For any community members who want to come together to discuss community challenges, as well as to create uh, resolutions to those challenges. And throughout that conversation, it was very clear with 100, 150 people in the room from a variety of nonprofit organizations and educational institutions that literacy and access to community literature for our residents in Joliet is a, a primary concern. We have a large amount of economically disadvantaged now, residents, we also have those that are really um, experiencing challenges with transportation and with the digital divide. And so providing those materials in a way that's accessible to them immediately is of our utmost concern. And our discussion really kind of corralled around how do we create these little hubs throughout the community to get these reading materials into, to get this community literature into. And I had just been reading an article from about Shorewood installing a little free library in their community and it just kind of came to be in our discussion that perhaps that might be a good solution. So after that discussion, every participant had the opportunity to 
apply for a, um, a grant up to $2,500 through the Chicago Community Trust through either an individual basis or as a nonprofit organization. And I chose to do that. And I'm glad to say that they funded it. And my priority was to take our large unincorporated map of uh, Joliet Township and to overlay that with uh, appropriate sites like uh, our school districts as well as our park district to see whether I could find sites that would be suitable in highly high, high density neighborhoods so that we could uh, scatter these little free libraries across the east side. And I'm glad to say that our, our public school district was very receptive to this idea as well as our park district. <laughs> and 12 little free libraries were created, 11 of which are in the ground. Six of them are at District 86 schools. Five of them, well, four of them and soon five are in public parks and one of them is in the greater Joliet area YMCA. Uh, part of this project uh, really involves public support, of course. Joliet Public Library does not officially sponsor these little free libraries. It was a personal grant. And so I, I really wanted to work with community organizations to establish who would be the stewards and sponsors of these little free libraries. Um, as much as I love them, I didn't want to visit each one of them multiple times a month <laughs> to ensure that they were filled with quality reading materials and community literature. And so uh, I'm happy to say that the Joliet Area Kiwanis Club and the Joliet Indian Lions Club all agree, they both agreed as well as our public school district to serve as the stewards and sponsors of the Little Free Libraries. Our friends of the library were very generous and continue to be very generous in routing materials that are both withdrawn from our collection but also donated from the community to fill these Little Free Libraries. Most importantly, of course, are the youth materials, making sure that those Little Free Libraries are stacked with books for children of all ages and so we do route our withdrawn materials to those little free libraries with no expectation that we will ever see them again. So that's a very important component is making sure that these materials are labeled appropriately and that people understand the concept of little free libraries. So one of the first things I did was go to speak to the school library media specialists and volunteers in our local school district. Um, those schools that do actually have functioning libraries because many of the schools in our district 86 do not have functioning libraries or libraries at all to ensure that they understood what these little free libraries were in front of their schools. And many of the library, the school library media specialists or library volunteers had never heard of little free libraries. So I also kind of imagined at that point that many people in our community would not know what a little free library is. You know, we're used to seeing little free libraries in affluent communities when we go on vacations, but those little free libraries that are in economically disadvantaged neighborhoods, we have to imagine that people don't know what these are, don't know if they can take these materials, don't know if they're library materials, do I have to bring them back, do I have to check them out? And so providing marketing materials, getting an online page to route people to, putting articles in the newspaper, making sure that library users understand what these are, all very uh, important components. Um, the construction of the Little Free Libraries, $2,500 doesn't go very far. If you are thinking about purchasing Little Free Libraries, you might not want to consider purchase, purchasing them through littlefreelibrary.org <laughs> simply because they're adorable, but they're not durable. And we live in the Midwest, and I, I really wanted to ensure that these were going to last the test of time. And uh, another uh, bonus of doing this as a personal grant was that I was able to work with my dad, who's a woodworker. <laughs> I did get the daughter discount. <laughs> Made out of green plywood, polycarbonate, um, rust-free hinges. It's very important to consider all of these things, not just for durability, but also for safety. And of course, considering vandalism. I'm, I'm really pleased to say that uh, the 11 little free libraries that are planted, there's only been one hot dog left in one little free library <laughs> at one time. And the rest, of the, the rest of the time, the only problems we've ever had are people leaving the books on the ground and they're done reading them. And of course, that's going to happen from time to time. Um, I am happy at any point for anyone who's interested in learning more about the actual specifics of, of doing a project like this to answer any questions you may have. Please don't hesitate to contact me, uh, C. Anikoski at JulietLibrary.org. You can always call me at Juliet Public Library too. I'm very happy to answer the specifics. There's a lot of stuff that goes into doing something like this. Uh, one of the most important components, aside from the funding, is to ensure that your, um, your city or your district 
your, uh, the ordinances for putting little free libraries in the ground, that's number one. You have to ensure before you start planting little free libraries in the ground that you, you know, that you take a look at the city codes. That was something I'm glad that um, I had the foresight to do that because had I done that and then asked, it would have been a really big problem. There are a lot of safety zones you have to keep in mind, you know, distance from the street. You don't want kids running across the street to get to little free libraries. You want these to be placed in areas that are well lit. They're going to be plowed and shoveled and uh, ideally in a little more populated areas. So a lot of stuff to consider. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me on that. Um, and as far as the reason, the, the areas where we picked, um, kind of selected, in looking at that uh, overall map of the unincorporated areas, there are a lot of schools and parks that really fit nicely in with those high density areas and also fit kind of the the scope of safety and security for, for those um, little free library sites. And so um, I would encourage those who are considering planting little free libraries in your community to consider putting those in the areas that will make the biggest difference and the largest impact. And looking at the GIS map data, taking a look at library service maps, overlaying those with your park district sites, with, with your schools, um, any other organizations like YMCA's that are willing to, to put those uh, and host those. Uh, that, that was the way that I went about it, and it's proven successful. Uh, they are very well enjoyed. They are very well used. They have, um, they have, like I said, not really been tampered with. And I think a, a big reason for that is because they have been adopted by sites. So better to put them at places with buildings attached to them, people that are going in there on a regular basis. The ones that are in the parks, a few of them do have buildings attached to them. A few of them are in kind of standalone parks. Ones we've experienced a few issues with are in those standalone parks. So kind of keep that in mind when you're, when you're thinking about um, where to put those. Um, as far as the school library component of it. We should stop and oh. see if anybody have, is that all right? We just stop Absolutely. and see if anybody has any questions. Um, no questions, but a lot of kudos. And thank you for the idea kind of things. Um, someone did, um, also have the idea of, um, hang on, I gotta find it. Um, oh wait, they're coming in so fast. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, um, oh, someone um, approached, um, or a, a Boy Scouts Eagle Project yes. was, ah. and I've heard of that too before, um, and she just said that that's another good place to look for construction and whatnot. Um, uh, someone approached a welding school in Peoria, so that's kind of wild. Um, Girl Scouts also. Um, and then I'll just quickly mention, too, yeah. regarding the kids' library cards. Yep. There has been a lot of talk about it on here. No direct questions, but a lot of comments and whatnot. And so we'll make sure to get um, things that we feel need to be answered. You know, we, we save the chats, so um, Deirdre will be able to see those. Positive, later. negative? A uh, lot of positive, a lot of like, questions yeah. and uh, some concerns and that yeah, sort of stuff. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. So, is there a question out there? At another site? I think someone's just not. Um, I think um, obviously it, these are these get people reading these little free libraries and of course where my brain went was and then they go get a library card um, probably not necessarily um, happen that often but um, whatever we can do to get people reading as you said quality things Absolutely. yeah um, one of the one of the things that we've been doing at July Public Library is analyzing how we provide those library cards to um, the unserved and underserved areas, the Joliet Township areas in particular. We have been working with the general mathematical formula for a very long time. It was $125 up until last year when it was uh, changed to $115 on average. And recently we adopted the, the taxpayer method, which is more responsive. And looking at the Rails Library Service map, and analyzing the public libraries that are uh, most closely situated to those larger areas that are um, show up as, as white on the map and unserved by libraries, uh, library after library after library or tax bill method. And it makes a lot of sense because it is responsive to the needs of those who are living um, in, in homes or renting homes instead of using that general mathematical formula, which provides a lot of challenges. 
uh, particularly because it is an average of, um, well, that it's an average of all of the homeowners within a city, but it's not actually including the averages of the township residents that you are actually trying to serve. So you're getting an average of taxpayers, not the uh, non-taxpayers. Right. It's not really, it doesn't really work all the time very right. well. Um, one of the conversations that I had with our uh, District 204, which is Joliet Township High School, that serves larger, a larger area than our city of Joliet. It also includes Rockdale, which is a, a, a village with no public library. Um, in talking with jo uh, District 204, we were really discussing reciprocal borrowing. And this goes back to see what you were saying earlier. Uh, one of the interesting things with the reciprocal borrowing rules through, uh, through the state is that it allows for public to public reciprocal borrowing, but what it does not permit is even within a consortium or within a library system, reciprocal borrowing from school to public and public to school. While within a consortium you can loan materials through rails, the reciprocal borrowing rules do not allow a, a, a cardholder at a, a public high school to use that, that library card, even though it's a full rails member library card, taxpayer funded library card through um, the same city as the public library, the reciprocal borrowing rules do not extend permissions to that high school student to register as a, as a reciprocal borrower in the public library. So that came up in our unserved, um, underserved uh, committee. Mm -hmm. And it is something that we would very much like to look further into. Mm -hmm. um, why would it not be permitted for a fully fledged um, Prairie Cat member to borrow a material from a through reciprocal borrowing from Joliet Public Library. We uh, Joliet Public Library is a Rails member. While we're in the Pinnacle Consortium, we see people from uh, Prairie Cat all the time. Uh, we are, you know, Boundary Library. Why should the high school not be included? Mm -hmm. Every city of Joliet resident pays high school tax, pays grade school tax. Maybe we can expand the reciprocal borrowing uh, permissions to uh, allow ease of access for those students who really need materials, especially through our District 86, because these kids don't have access to a, to a school library. Right. Rockdale does not have access to a public library. We need to be thinking about these things. So um, I know there's going to be more exploration of that. Um, one of the bonuses of this little free library project was to increase our partnership with our public school district therefore allowing us more conversation, more capacity for creating intergovernmental agreements between ourselves and, and the public, uh, public schools, which we are currently pursuing. And uh, I've been very appreciative of RAILS. They've provided us with a lot of really wonderful information, data, uh, answers to questions, and support. And um, I'm grateful to be on the Universal Service Committee, too, to be able to help address these issues for all the libraries and all of the residents of Illinois. Thank you so much for giving me the time to talk about this today. Oh, thank you, Catherine. And uh, that was, um, uh, as you can, as you can um, tell from what Catherine had to say, um, the meeting really was a great discussion of incremental things we can do to extend service to the unserved in ways that make sense. And I think that, you know, the, the uh, idea about the school libraries, which, you know, people are paying taxes, et cetera, uh, is another example of, and the tax formula as well. Just you know, these are these are um, really positive ways of, of of trying to move forward. And we will definitely be discussing, I think, all of these with the committee and with the state library. Um, and I just want to reiterate what uh, what Nikki said. We'll certainly look at the entire chat. It's one of my favorite things to do to see everything I missed during the member update. Um, <laughs> To um, to see what else, and and we know that these there's you know there's always a downside, um, but it just seems like that you know we we really need to examine what that downside might be to these specific ideas and to see uh, and to you know to gauge when the upside outweighs the downside and how we might um, you know be able to uh, as I say extend the service uh, to people who really need it. So any uh, further comments, questions at this point? Lots of comments, okay. but no <laughs> questions yet. So anybody want to say anything out loud? For the benefit of the entire group? <laughs> 
All right. I guess not. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, um, moving on to the statewide database proposal, um, I'm sure a lot of you remember filling out a survey um, about this uh, last fall, late fall. Um, we worked th through and with um, ILA and the Public Policy Committee and the Advocacy Committee to develop some legislative asks for the uh, fiscal 2021 budget. And uh, one of the asks was, this, was a proposal that there be additional funding put into the Secretary of State's budget to provide uh, access to databases statewide to all libraries. Um, so this, uh, uh, th we did a lot of research. There are most states, I wanna, and, I'm, and when I say most, I'm, I'm saying like 48 um, out of 50 already do this and have been doing it for years with great success. So what the way it works is that um, there's an amount of money uh, we asked for, how much did we end up asking for? three, four, five million, something like that. Um, five million, between two and five million annually, um, because it would probably take us a while to ramp up. But in any case, you get this money and then you, you, do, you put together an RFP, you have a very uh, robust, knowledgeable uh, selection committee that looks at a suite of databases that would be useful for all types and sizes of libraries. Um, and the survey was what, um, was what we used to find out what the interest would be, what the database sort of preferences were. And, um, and then we looked at other states to see what they were doing and how much money they were spending and compared our population to theirs. Um, Layla Heath is nodding her head. She was she masterminded a lot of the research. Um, so anyway, so we did put this forward. It um, was one of ILA's priorities, um, and we are waiting now to hear what is going to happen with it. Um, uh, I am optimistic because um, Greg McCormick is optimistic. <laughs> so, um, you know, no guarantees, but um, we'll see what happens. It, as I say, there's, I think, a really great case can be made for this. It benefits all libraries, benefits libraries that already have the databases because they can then redirect those funds to other, you know, local needs. It benefits libraries that don't have databases because now they have a resource that they couldn't offer before. It really, it, you know, it just kind of raises everybody up. Um, obviously, we also made the, the, uh, the point that these, you know, the minimum wage uh, increase is, 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 is placing a, a challenge on library budgets. And um, this could, as I say, these dollars freed up could be used for that, don't have to be obviously, but just pointing out all of the um, all the possibilities. Speaking of library budgets in general, we also asked for an increase in the per capita grant for both public and school libraries. There hasn't been an increase in, I'm gonna say, decades. Um, so both of these requests went to the, state, um, to the state library and to the Secretary of State, and they were both um, uh, priorities of the Illinois Library Association. <coughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so we will see. Um, any questions about any of that? I do have a question. Um, and a kudos from someone who said that the uh, Michigan State Library has this. Yes, yep. Michigan is one of the um, 48 states. Which has not <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, would we be able to see what databases came out as likely to be included if this gets funded? Um, we were weeding ours, and it would be helpful to know what might be there next year. Sure. I mean, it's by no means, you know, a sure thing that those would be the databases. It will be, these will be selected by, a, you know, a group of you all when the time comes, but we can certainly do that. Um, we, can, we can post information about what 
other states buy too. And you, there's a lot of similarity. Um, I don't know if it's in this, is it? Well, okay. So for example, in the survey data, following databases identified as being of the most critical importance to libraries, ProQuest and Ancestry.com in particular, Gale opposing viewpoints, uh, Gale in context. I don't know what these things mean. I'll just read them. Hopefully you all know. Um, EBSCO master file complete that includes consumer reports, World Book, Gale Virtual Reference Library. Somewhere I heard the New York Times too though. Oh yeah, here we go. New York Times, uh, Reference USA, Global News Stream, World History in Context, JSTOR. These are just some that did come up, but we'll post the information as well. Can Does I that... just say a caution yes. on that? That when, when um, we would go out for our, the RFPs would go out, it also depends on the vendor response. So for instance, there might be opposing viewpoints from EBSCO it's on our survey, but perhaps Gale with come in with an opposing viewpoints type of database that they, they would offer the competitive price. So, right. so that's just kind of a caveat um, to, to that. Right. To, to when, we, when we post this, these things. So hopefully that gives you a good flavor that they're very, they're, they're general, very high quality as, as well. Other questions or comments? Well, you got a request for newspapers.com. <laughs> okay. Um, and Lexus, Texas. Yeah, we got, oh, we got a really good, good response from the survey. <laughs> Ooh, a foreign language learning database. Yeah, we we'll get a lot of suggestions yes. now, which yeah. we will. <laughs> yeah, and that's great. That's great. Um, it just shows, you know, it just shows the need that people just, it just like, you don't have to think about it very, very long to know. Oh. Sorry? Oh. We have a question in East Peoria, or I do. Yes. Um, is, is the intent for it to be um, kind of how we do databases now individually at libraries, or is the thought to be more like the biblioboard model that is has to do with like boundaries of the state and serves everyone regardless? Just well, the idea would be that it would be for everybody and you would not have to pay for it. Well, no, so I don't okay. know. I get that. No, okay, it, I, get, it, I didn't understand it, your question, I guess. So, I guess is the thought they have to authenticate with a public library or a yeah. system library, or is it more like biblioboard as long as they're in the boundaries of the state it I, works kind of thing? I gotcha. I think that will depend on the vendor. Yeah, okay. I mean, and, and uh, of course we would get remote access, of course, also, you know, not just in library use, but that will depend on the vendor. And sometimes they're pretty sticky about authentication. but. We'll see. Good questions. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't understand. Yep. Anybody else? Okay. Um, well, stay tuned. Um, so I, I heard, the, we heard that Aurora was up. Are you out there, Aurora? I don't see you. If they unmute, maybe oh, they will. Uh, Ryan's checking. You're still in the dark, New Lennox. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Ryan would just say Aurora. groovy. There's Aurora. Good morning. This is Benjamin Westlow from the West Chicago Public Library. Unfortunately, I'm holding down the fort by myself. <laughs> well, it's nice to see you. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> sure. I appreciate okay. it. Sure. Okay. Anything online there? Okay. No, we're good. Okay. Um, Amy has joined us. Hi. Good morning. Um, I'm Amy De La Fuente, and I am the um, program manager for the um, census project. Uh, Rails received a grant, and um, we are ramping things up. We have. Um, been doing a lot of work in the short time that I've been here. So I'm thrilled to be part of this project. And um, just quick FYI, we have 75 days until <laughs> April 1st, which is the official census date. Um, so with our grant, we are focusing on the Collar County region, which includes McHenry, Lake, DuPage, K-12, 
Kane, Kendall, Grundy, Kankakee, and Will counties. At the moment, we have 23 confirmed subrecipients. 19 of them are libraries. And uh, there are also a few county level organizations as well as a few social service or nonprofit organizations spanning these eight counties. Um, also, we are um, possibly going to be working with three other um, library subrecipients. At the moment, we're trying to help them uh, become GATA compliant and complete their applications. Um, so originally when Rails applied for this grant, they um, expressed the ability to reach a variety of the hard to count populations as defined by the um, USCensus.gov. And um, since the state has asked them to narrow their focus on six hard to count communities. So for those of you out there who are one of our sub recipients, please excuse the all the information that you currently know <laughs> because you've been hearing about this a lot uh, for the past two months. So those include um, those six hard to count populations that we're asking our sub recipients to focus on include children under the age of five, older adults, renters, people living at or um, below the poverty line, um, people who are considered young and mobile, so that's typically your 18 to 24 year old population, and then also people experiencing homelessness. And homelessness can also mean that you're doubling up, not just that um, you do not um, have a dwelling that's sort of like a house to sleep in that is your own. Um, so. At the moment, um, we're doing a lot of work to help support our subrecipients. Um, they have put forth a lot of unique um, plans to help meet the needs of the hard to count populations in their community. Um, so just a few of those. Um, so Juliet Public Library is going to be targeting seniors during their mall walking time. Um, Aurora Public Library is uh, planning a visit from the count to <laughs> kind of tie into being counted for the census. Um, West Chicago is um, doing some apartment outreach. Um, uh, Highwood is working with Promotoras to share information about the census. And um, St. Charles is um, doing some outreach at local laundromats um, targeting various populations, but not um, limited, uh, they're focusing more on um, the zero to five populations. And so laundromats are a frequent place for book swaps and information sharing. So um, we have um, been doing things like reviewing applications and helping everybody get GATA compliant. Um, then we helped everybody with um, budget revisions, including our own. Um, we planned our and held our first subrecipient meeting in January, and um, we're currently in the process of providing further support for our subrecipients, such as um, biweekly calls, site visits, and then um, always asking them to document the work that they're doing, submit different uh, reports so that we can then in turn submit those reports to the state because we want to find out um, what our outreach looks like, how many lives we've touched through all of this census work, and um, just keep a great detailed record so that at the end of this project, the state can say, um, in hindsight, this was money that was well invested. Um, our public dollars went to um, enabling communities to put forth their best resources and um, using their uh, trusted messengers in order to reach these hard to count populations. And um, on the horizon, our subrecipients are um, really starting to dig into their census engagement activities. And um, lastly, Rails um, has been calling information about the census and they've created a census page um, so I encourage all of you to make sure that you check that page regularly. Um, our communications team is providing ample updates. They're going to be sharing resources so that you don't have to go to the census um, website. You should just be looking to Rails to provide you with a lot of information, including videos, um, links. Um, there are some free downloadable materials, a lot of material from the census website that you can print and provide at your library. Um, also, uh, it would be great if 
all of you could join the census listserv that was created. Um, so it's census 2020. And this is an opportunity for you to just have regular interactions. Um, and you can ask questions, you can post comments, you can um, share things that you're doing at your library. Um, we want this to be a collaborative process. So whether your library is a subrecipient of the grant, whether your library is in the Collar County or whether you're located somewhere else, um, Illinois has a responsibility with their libraries to uh, provide access um, so that people feel comfortable completing the census, especially since this is the first time that it is online. So um, what better way to build community and to be able to collaborate with your fellow colleagues across the state than to come together for the census and um, utilize each other as resources. So um, thank you for your time. And um, I hope that I'll see many of you on the, the census listserv. And I hope that um, you'll enjoy and find the resources provided um, uh, very useful. And um, feel free to reach out if you have any questions. And if I could just add, the census page is another one of those library post pages <laughs> that we mentioned. It's at the very top of the Rails homepage. Um, we're really hoping that those library post pages will, you know, get people, get libraries information about really important issues. There's also one there for e-resources. Mm -hmm. um, there will be one soon for the um, unserved. There's one for the minimum wage, and of course the census. We also include regular articles in our e-news. We're, we're really trying to spread the word about all of the different, there's tons of materials available from the Census, mm -hmm. material, census Bureau, but they're hard to find. So we're trying to organize it and make it a little easier for libraries to find exactly what they're looking for. And Dan did share the link uh, directly to that census page in the chat if you guys are on chat. Um, and there is a comment about um, from Har Harvey Library is hosting its third census job fair. Uh, tomorrow, noon to two, a census representative will discuss the importance of participating in the count during their annual Martin Luther King celebration, also scheduled for tomorrow at 5.30. That's great. Yeah. Yes, they still need census workers. Right. Um, so if you're interested in hosting a census job fair, then um, you can definitely reach out to, I would say, check with your um, your colleague from Harvey to find out what the process was to get a census worker out and um, and host this event. A lot of you probably have um, complete count committees too right. in your local right. communities, okay. they're good sources. And League of Women Voters is just itching to get into as many libraries as possible and work with um, their community partners so that they can provide support for the census. So. Um, there are a lot, of, a lot of people that want to come together and collaborate to make sure that we get a complete and accurate count. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. And um, this probably doesn't need to be said, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, census is really important, both for uh, representation in um, Washington, D.C. There's already a very strong belief, I guess, that Illinois is going to lose at least one Congressional, congressional district because of population loss. Um, uh, plus, you know, it, it's the census, the count is, is, is how federal money is divided up among the states. That includes money for libraries, money for delivery, <laughs> money for lots of, lots of things. So, um, and it's not, it doesn't just you know, it doesn't just come to libraries, it goes to universities, it goes to, you know, you, you think of any public entity, it's, there's, there's, there's federal money there. So um, we're all, this is important for all of us, so. Yes. I'm just gonna add to that because you were talking about the importance and someone's commenting um, uh, about the privacy aspect yes. of things and people's, you know, worry about yes. that. Um, and just the, I, just to let people know too that the census 
information is not shared for 72 years. Right. And um, there's a law against it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's so, a fine as well. Yeah. yeah. So they take it very seriously. And, and actually, curiously, someone was also asking if anyone knows if there's any children's books on the census. Yes, there's actually a free downloadable <coughs> book um, related to the census, or you can order books as well. Um, but if you wanted um, to go the route of printing the books and children, I think, can color them in, that link is posted on our, um, our census page that's on the Rails website. So make sure that you check that out. Great. Yeah, and a lot of people are doing census job fairs, which is good. That's great. good. They absolutely, on that side of things, they need, mm -hmm. they need help too. So as always, libraries are very involved in the census. Um, we're glad that we can help our subrecipients, especially, but obviously we're involved in helping everybody and we'll be making um, some, you know, materials, marketing, bookmarks, et cetera, available very widely. And this grant covers the color counties. You know, you had to pick a region, so we did. Um, but hopefully, wherever you are out there in Railsland, you've got regional intermediaries there that you can reach out to, and they will help you. <coughs> Anything else? Again, lots of comments and whatnot, but I, um, not, no direct questions. OK. Anybody want to say anything out loud? <laughs> Probably not. OK, um, we were going to have a report from Selena from Waukegan, but she is ill, so we will not be having that report. So we will move on to the My Library Is campaign. And um, do you have your lights on yet, um, New Lennox? Only audio working right now. OK, all right. Um, I'm asking because um, I wanna, I'm going to talk about the video that's coming soon. Um, as you know, we did a video last year, Dreams Take Flight. This year we're doing, um, in fact, we're just, we we're just seeing the first cuts of it today, actually. Um, it's about, it's called The Elders of the Internet. And it's um, set in the future, and it's, uh, it's, it answers the question of why libraries are even more important in the age of the internet. Um, the question that you always get asked that is not easy to answer. And um, so uh, I want to give a shout out to Lauren Offerman. Thank you, Lauren, so much, because um, her brother, Nick Offerman, is the star of our video. Um, from, you know, Ron Swanson from Parks and Rec fame. <laughs> so um, it's, it's really, um, as a, again, thank you so much, Lauren. Thank you. Thank you, Nick, <laughs> wherever you are. Um, he um, shared part of his Thanksgiving vacation with, with Rails <laughs> and the company that is making the video. So um, that is coming soon. And uh, the, this, this absolutely is relevant to every type of library, every size, every every whatever. So um, we're very excited about it. So stay tuned for that. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Mary to talk about the rest of the My Library Is. Yeah, There's just a few other things that are going on. Uh, libraries are still looking for talking points, and we are working on those. We wanted that we drafted up some talking points with the help of a consultant. And we've been sharing those with some of our members from all different types of libraries. We've gotten great feedback. Thanks to everyone that's provided feedback on those talking points. So we'll now incorporate that and um, hopefully pretty soon we'll have a good document to share with everybody. Um, we've also I've got two of my colleagues here. We also want to just give you a quick update on our continuing education related to the campaign and our um, Grant, so I'll start maybe with Diana Rush on the continuing education. Sure, thanks Mary. Um, I just wanted to point or highlight two upcoming events that we have. Um, Barbara Alvarez, many of, uh, uh, she's well known throughout the library community. She will be doing a two week online uh, marketing course for us uh, through Teachable, so it's self paced. Um, and you can start uh, registering for that on L2. 
Um, and in March, we will also have um, Angela Hirsch, who runs superlibrarymarketing.com and just uh, received a new position at Novelist. She will be doing a webinar for us in March and an in-person workshop in April. So just wanted to highlight those. Keep your eyes open. Great. Okay, thanks, Diana. Now we'll turn to Dan Bostrom and talk about some grants we have connected with the campaign. Yeah, yeah so these are the My Library Is Grants, uh, and the applications were due back in November, but uh, we are just getting uh, to announcing them. So there's four projects that we're awarding, uh, and the first one is Fresh Start Marketing, and that's Eureka Public Library District, Genoa Public Library District, and the Pontiac Public Library. Uh, and they are going to be working with a marketing consultant uh, to do auditing of their current marketing materials. Uh, the Fox River Grove Memorial Library in 30 Seconds project is by the Fox River Grove Memorial Library. And uh, they are going to develop a video uh, to promote uh, the value of the library and the things you know, that the library is doing uh, in the community. Uh, the Rockford Public Library, Cherry Valley Public Library, and North Suburban Public Library District are uh, working on a collaboration called A Thousand Books Before Kindergarten Promotion. And uh, they're going to develop some marketing materials to sort of get the word out about all of their Thousand Books Before uh, Kindergarten program. And then finally, the Skokie Public Library is working with the Skokie Morton Grove School District 69 on a project called My Library Is a Partner Grow in Growing Young Readers. And again, they're going to use that money to promote their, um, uh, their reading program uh, for youth and families. Uh, and so the uh, information about these grants will be available very soon. Uh, there's no uh, press release right now, but we're expecting that probably next week. So thank you. Thanks, Dan. And finally, I just want to remind everybody about our website. It's mylibraryis.org, O-R-G. Um, and that is growing. The traffic is growing on there. Every day, the numbers get higher. Um, I also want to remind everybody there's a sharing showcase on there. And we still are looking for contributions from all types of libraries, You know, whether you're big or small academic, public, school, or special. Everybody has something to share that they've used to tell their library story or to promote their library. Um, the really popular section of the site, the blog, is pretty popular. And then also the library stories are pretty popular. So if you have any story about how your library successfully helped a patron or we don't think that it's too small. We're really looking for contributions from everybody. So please check out that site and add to it. And if you have any questions, we'd be pleased to answer them now. Or at any time. Any qu nope. No questions Thank online. You. I guess no questions out there. Thanks, you guys. OK. Anne's going to tell us about Recreating L2. That's right. Um, hopefully you all know that we are working on a complete overhaul of L2. Um, at our last member update, we were in final negotiations with the vendor that we chose. So I'm happy to be able to tell you, and we've announced this in e-news as well, that um, we are working with a vendor called Atten. They're out of Denver, and they work uh, exclusively with nonprofit and mission-driven organizations. Um, and one of the products they've worked on that really helped sell them to us is that they worked with the Richland Public Library in South Carolina on a Knight Foundation funded grant project to develop a library event calendar using the Drupal software. Uh, so we're going to be able to leverage that right away. It contains um, many of the features that we're looking for, and they're able to continue the development on that project to help it fit our um, more complex needs. Uh, so they've been great to work with, and they're really able to hit the ground running. We've been so pleased um, at the seeming ease which, which, with which they've been able to understand our complexity, um, which is super impressive. I mean, we've all been in the position of having to try to figure out like what all of these structures and organizations do and do together. Um, so that project from that standpoint is going really well. Um, we are working with a pretty tight development timeline. Um, so we're 
reviewing wireframes, they're starting design work. We're going to be seeing things like color palettes and layouts soon. It's going to look great. Um, and development starts formally in about two weeks. So we're currently targeting um, a go live in the late summer. Um, so you will hear a lot more about the project before that happens, including opportunities for learning and training about in how to use the new platform. Um, and then it's also important to know that once we get through kind of the immediate post go live, we'll start working on planning for certification because certification in 2021 will happen on the L2 platform. So again, something you'll hear a lot more about. Um, that'll be exactly a year from now, since certification is currently happening now, and I'm sure all of you have completed it. <laughs> Thank you, um, Anne, for that commercial. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, for now, we do ask that um, all of you directors or um, director designees look at your library's listing in the current L2 and make any updates that are necessary, including to your staff lists and trustee lists, that will really help us have clean data to migrate. And that's something that we'll be working on um, a great deal internally over the coming months. Um, so again, we will have more information out to you as it's available. This project is moving quickly and um, there will be lots of developments between now and go live. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions now or you can reach out to me individually anytime. Any questions? And I'll, you know, uh, seriously, following up on the commercial, uh, please certify. Um, it's going. It's, on, it's going on now. Our administrative team is working on it constantly. I, I imagine you have, it's on. You know, until March thirty first. Okay, Layla, you're going to talk about discounts and group purchases. Yes, um, so we've got a few deals um, that are live right now. Um, one of them is OpenGov. That is a resource that will take your library statistics, and these are statistics, whether they're financial statistics, your uh, door counts, your pro number of programs. They will take whatever statistics um, you choose, and they will put them into uh, forms like graphs that are not only attractive, but you can manipulate them. So um, if you post them on your website, for example, your patrons can click on it and see how your collection development budget breaks down or that or how your programs break down. Um, the other part of it that is interesting is that you can take those statistics and they have tools that will let you put them both into a reporting format and or if you need to use them for a survey. Um, so this is just great. It, it ties in with telling your library story. So you're not just posting the statistics, but if you have something to say about them, like, you know, these, these um, this happened because of, or that type of thing. One library did a survey and they wanted, um, they wanted to ask their patrons where they would like to have a second location located. And so patrons could actually click on locations on a map and, and then um, OpenGov was able to compile that into some meaningful results. So um, OpenGov has one three and five year pricing model. It is 50% off, no setup fee. And we have 10 libraries that signed up in November and December. And just those 10 libraries represent, they collectively saved 36,000 in the first year. All of them signed up either, they took advantage of the three to five year pricing. So over the lifetime, they will save 158,000 just for those 10 libraries. So I hope you take a look at it. Um, it, it I think can be a very helpful resource. Another one that we have is Swank Movie Licensing. This one, um, I'm sure some of you remember the, the flurry of uh, emails that went through regarding that on a programming list served about a year ago. We did procure a 30% off discount for the 2020 calendar year. This is a very uh, aggressive discount for licensing um, and in, it also was extended to renewing libraries as well as new libraries. This um, is important because when a vendor agrees to do this, they are basically absorbing a loss by extending to current customers. And they asked as part of this deal 
the rails, and we also brought um, Heartland into this deal, that the two systems bring in 150 new library customers to the, to the deal um, to help offset the loss that they were taking in order to continue the 30% off after 2020. So all libraries who are renewing um, this year enjoy the 30% as well as new. We are short of our 150 <laughs> goal. Um, so Swank did agree um, that they would offer another group purchase this spring. So I will be putting out more information about that. It will probably be sort of that March, April time period, but it would start July 1st. It's based on 2020 as opposed to 2019 prices, um, which is there about 5% higher than 2019. It's still a really great deal, and I would say, um, you know, if you are looking, if you're exploring the idea of a movie license, this is a great time to try it. If you have another movie license, um, the ones that are offered, the movies that are licensed through Swank are, are different than, they, they have additional offerings. Um, the, the movie licenses can also, I mean, we think about like, you know, uh, just a, a, a all ages kind of movie showing or something like that. But there are other things you can do with it. One interesting thing that Swank actually had told me about is they did a program that was targeted to populations with sensory needs. And it was a way to, um, you know, address um, or, or to, to offer something for that population by using low lighting and quieter sounds, things like that. Um, of course, you can also incorporate a craft, food or book discussion related to a movie. So there's a lot of things to do. The Swank website offers um, offers some suggestions too. So um, that is Swank Movie Licensing. And then the, the last one I'm going to talk about that's currently going on is RD Digital Unlimited. That offer is available um, until March 31st, and it offers significantly reduced prices from what they originally uh, kind of promoted about a year ago. That this um, RV Digital Unlimited audiobook collection includes over 32,000 titles, both fiction, nonfiction, and juvenile titles, and they're available for simultaneous use on the RV Digital platform. They also have, are offering Who Knew It and Universal Class Educational Resources, and those databases are also available at 50% off. Um, and any of these deals you can see through our Deals and Discounts page. Um, which we've hopefully reorganized to make it a little easier for you. We used to have a few different sections and um, we're getting confused about what was in what section, so it's just a straight alphabetical list now and we highlight the newest things at the top. Um, these offerings have been mostly focused on public libraries. We are turning our attention now to that K through 12 and looking into some things like Yale, Scholastic, EBSCO, we're in the beginning stages of talks with them, so I'm hoping that um, some things will come from that as well as um, some other uh, vendors. So it does take some time to work through the deals. Um, they can be complex. They obviously involve a lot of libraries and, and money, but um, I've, I'm just so happy to hear about any types of resources you've identified as important. Um, please feel free to call or email me. My contact information is on the deals and discounts page. Um, but I uh, really, these deals that we already, um, that we have live right now have all been due to, to somebody coming to me and say, saying, hey, this, this is important and, or we need it. So um, please, please keep letting us know. And um, well, thank you for your time. Okay. I will add that um, in the Rails e-news, we also have a deals um, and discount section. And so anytime something, um, you know, that Layla has something new that it's always there. Um, and it's there usually repeated several times as well. And um, as Dan said on chat, um, just make sure you are logged into L2 when you are viewing the deals and discounts webpage because it'll give you all of the deals um, rather than just some all for members anything out there any questions or anything no any any questions from anybody out there at the sites all right 
Great work, Layla. It's a lot of savings. Thank you. Okay. Speaking of great work, <laughs> Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, so we ended our first nine months um, with Explore More Illinois um, at the end of December. So April 1st, we started with 87 libraries and 14 attractions, and we ended the year with 246 libraries participating and 28 attractions. So that was great growth. Um, our, um, our, res, um, our patrons made 776 reservations uh, using Explore More Illinois. Our most popular attraction was the Peoria Riverfront Museum. And the library that made the most reservations was the Morton Public Library. Oh. So, um, right. yeah, so that's great. Um, what we're looking to do in 2020 is increase our attractions list and try to have like more um, attractions dispersed geographically in our rails area. So that's something I'm working really hard on. Um, I'm also trying to um, do more presentations, like both in person. So I'm going to my first networking group next week. If you're a member of a networking group and you'd like me to come and talk about Explorer Illinois, just send me an email because um, I'd really like to get out and, and talk about the program in person and I can demonstrate it and show you how it works. Um, and I'm also looking at ways to do some um, networking virtually. So um, look for information about that in the e-newsletter that I send out for Explore More Illinois members. And if you're not on the newsletter, um, you can just email info at exploremoreillinois.org and we can add you to the monthly e-newsletter that I send out. So thank you so much for promoting it in your libraries. If you have any questions, just feel free to send me an email um, and I can get back with you on you know, what, uh, what I need to set you up. Uh, what information we need from your library. Um, we're really trying to get 100% participation for our Rails members this year. That's one of our goals. You, you want to say it? Oh, go ahead. There is a question okay. um, which um, I think would benefit everybody yeah. from hearing. So it says, Jessica, when you approach an attraction, what do they need to do to be included? Um, can we help bring them on board at all? We have some small museums around here. I'm not sure where she is. Okay. Um, that we'd love to be able to get, um, oh, decal. That we'd oh, okay. love to yes. be able to get people passes. Yes. Yeah. So we would love to have your help. And if you have connections to museums in your area, we often find that having an in or a connection with those museums is really helpful. You know, it's one thing for me to send out an email to somebody that I think is the right person at an attraction, um, but you know, obviously those emails sometimes go unanswered or people don't know what the program is. So if you have connections, uh, please contact me. Basically what the attraction needs is some kind of offer. So whether that's discounted admission, discounted parking, uh, cafe or gift store purchases. We even have one museum that has free admission but gives a tote bag to everyone who makes a reservation um, at using Explore More Illinois. So there needs to be some kind of offer that is unique to Explore More Illinois users. So that's really the main thing that we need from an attraction. Um, but if you have a connection or um, if there's an attraction in your area that you're interested in, just send me an email. Um, I can tell you that I've sent hundreds and hundreds of emails to attractions around <laughs> <laughs> Illinois. Um, but like I said, having that personal connection really makes a difference, we find. It's very flexible, right? I mean, yes. This, um, the... So, and you can tell this to people that you might know who are affiliated with museums or other potential attractions. We can customize it so that they can pick certain days of the week. Um, they can pick how long they want the offer to run for. Um, it's a really customizable software, so it doesn't just have to be one size fits all. Um, we have one museum that offers, you know, like the first Wednesday of the month is a free day. So, you know, it's just one day out of the month. Um, and we can always edit and change it. There's no contract to sign, and the attractions don't pay anything to be part of Explore More Illinois. That's probably also a really important thing to tell them. Right, so, I mean, you guys know in yeah. your in your locations, your communities, what the the attractions are. I mean, obviously, we know a lot of them. You've learned about a lot yes, more of yes. them, <laughs> but um, we can't possibly know all of them. So, yeah, the more suggestions yeah. you have, the yeah. better. And, and and you know best what your uh, your users want. You know which attractions would work best for your users. So, I'd love to hear any feedback that you might have, or if you can help us add more, that would be great. 
Anything else? Not on this topic. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I may as well just throw it out there. Seeing, are, we, are we in between? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So I would like to know what CE Rails will be looking to offer to libraries in regards to the sexual harassment legislation as the cost is a concern for this year. Um, I consider this legislation requirement an unfunded Fund mandate. mandate yeah. This is the requirement that everybody get trained. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. You have anything you would like to say about that, that about um, that, Diana? No, I have not discussed that with Joe yet. But um, it's on. Uh, I believe we're going to start discussing tomorrow. Yeah. It's a very good question. Yes, it is a requirement now that there be anti-sexual. I mean, you know what? You know. Don't <laughs> on how to you know so but it, yes it is a law now, and uh, you know one of the ways obviously is for you know people to group together and we give CE grants so that's kind of an obvious so stay tuned for more information on that. Thank you for the question. I I think Emily is referring back to this as well. Um, she says we really need a web-based training we can give to staff, especially those. Who are only here a few hours a week. Yep. Yep. Got it. Thank you. Watch our e news. We publish all the CE we offer in our e news. So. Yep. That, that's a good suggestion. Thank you. This is the time for attendees to share their library news or to just ask or bring up anything else you want to bring up. Any takers out there? I, if it's okay, I'd like to just share that after several years of very hard work on behalf of uh, Megan Mellon, the executive director of Joliet Public Library and the board and the staff, we now have a city funded um, project for our Ottawa Street branch. We're going to be able to start renovating, fully renovating and restoring the 1903 original building as well as the 1991 addition in downtown Joliet. Hopefully as soon as the end of this year, we're already hard at work in architect meetings and we've been planning for this for many years. So I'm um, just very grateful that the city approved that funding and um, it's always good news when a library gets support from its community, and we're very excited. So, just wanted to just throw that out there. Great job! Yes. Really great. <laughs> Kudos, congratulations, and great for the city and the residents. That's right. Yep. Um, so, uh, to go back to the CE, the sexual harassment, the anti-sexual harassment. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, really, you know. Yeah. Right. Um, it, um, Antonia mentions that Paylocity, for those of you who have Paylocity, they offer a web-based training for sexual harassment as part of the payroll package. Oh, okay. um, and Natalie says that they opened a makerspace called the Build Guild. And That's where is cute. that? Natalie, where are you? Um, I can't, can I tell from? Natalie Bazan? Oh yeah, North Riverside. North Riverside. Thank you, Natalie. Okay. Great. Anything else? Any any of the sites? I'll go around and I got one more. Okay. Um. Oh, oh, hang on. <laughs> so, um, Donna says delayed renovations at our branch in Roanoke uh, are winding down, and we hope to reopen there in late March or early April. Um, the branch has been closed for almost a year, and patrons mm -hmm. have been. Um, going to pop-up locations or other branches. Oh, pop-up locations, that's interesting. And Lisa Williams says, we just added two exercise bike desks with a grant and patrons <laughs> are pleased to exercise minds and bodies. Great. And um, Milledgeville Public Library, do I, I said that wrong, didn't I? Milledgeville? Milledgeville. Milledgeville. Um, I always forget. It has received several memorial donations in the last several months which have been earmarked for digitization of the um, Milledgeville Free Press, which was published from 
1880-ish to 1943. We are in the process of collecting those, um, collecting loose newspapers in our archives and hope to get digitization started, started over the summer. Um, West Juliet and Juliet Central High School libraries are being remodeled this summer. We're very excited, yay. Um, we will have pop-up libraries at both campuses at the beginning of the school year. <laughs> Pause for now. I don't have anything else right now. All right, well, let's go around the sites and see. How about in Coal Valley? Anybody have anything that you want to bring up? No, I don't think so. Thank you, though. OK, thank you. How about East Peoria? Nothing here. OK. How about Aurora? Uh, I guess I can say a few things. We're working on the Census 2020, obviously, as yeah. one of the sub-recipients. Uh, I'm about to execute a uh, signage redesign for our library in the next month or so. Uh, we have also, in the next six weeks, a chiller replacement for our building. Uh, we are currently revising our strategic plan, and I'm working on an RFP for a accounting firm. So. We have a few things we're working on. <laughs> that's a lot. Not doing too much. <laughs> Good for you. That's great. I hope you're not doing all of that by yourself. Yeah. <laughs> I have some help. Cherry. OK, good. <laughs> How about Cherry Valley? Anything, Jane? I know you got the grant. That's great. Congrats. Yes, and thank you for that. That's wonderful. Um, we also will be starting a building addition this spring. We'll oh. be breaking ground um, when winter is over. Uh, we had been saving for it to happen eventually, and then an anonymous donor came forth with a gift of a half a million dollars. Oh, my and the request goodness. That, I know, Fantastic. I know. And with, with the request that we do it sooner rather than later, so we were happy to oblige. So um, we will be adding <laughs> onto our building. We'll be adding, I know, we'll be adding uh, to our youth services department. We'll be adding a youth services program room, which we've never had before. And then we'll, we'll also be adding a drive up book return. So we're really excited about all of that and um, putting the final touches on the specs that'll be going out for bid later next month. And then we'll go from there. That is great news. Wow. That's a, that's a nice person, whoever that is. <laughs> yes. Well, and I will say, he and he would want me to say this, that um, one thing, the main thing that has really spurred his donation is the quality service that he's, that he's received at our library. So kudos to my staff for that. And, you know, that's just great. Yep. That is great. Heartwarming. How about Freeport? Anything? I guess not. Anybody at the State Library? I don't think so. <coughs> no. Um, anything else in LaSalle? Um, this is Patty at Robert Wall. We just com completed a uh, community survey and we're working on a, also a strategic plan. And we have Jim Gibbons coming uh, Monday, January 27th, and he's going to be pr uh, doing a program on the 1893 Chicago World's Fair. Oh, great. Okay, great. North Riverside added that they are also a census worker training location. Oh, great. Okay. Anything else in LaSalle? No, ma'am. Okay, thank you. How about New Lenox? This is New Lenox. We're still in the dark, but I can assure you the lights are actually on here. Um, I'm excited to announce here at New Lenox, this is Michelle Kreswick, um, that our library paid off the bonds for our building last month. Oh, so we're very great. excited to be debt free. And as a result, we're using this opportunity to ask for an operational tax rate increase on the March primary election. So just asking for that same amount back to be redirected to the operational rate to attend to uh, building maintenance and 
hopefully be open on Sundays in the future. So send all your good vibes and well wishes my way because I'm going to need it. <laughs> <laughs> good luck. Good luck. Yes. Okay, nobody's in Quincy. Anything at Sterling? Hi. Okay. Walnut yes. Public Library was um, gifted with memorial money to start a reading garden that used to be our old, unused, overgrown, yucky parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> we have started, yeah, it was pretty bad. We have started with um, digging up the old rocks, dirt, everything. We laid some grass seed and that started growing last summer. Um, we also had a gentleman that built us a large bench, a smaller bench, two chairs and a table to go in between the two chairs to add to wow. our garden. So this year we're going to look into getting plantings, um, continue to help our grass grow with, it's kind of, it, it's a weird area because part of it's shady with trees, part of it's in full sun. So I, I'm going to hire somebody to kind of help me manipulate that area back there. So I plant the right things in the right places that'll continue mm -hmm. to grow. But that's what we're in the middle of right now. That's great. <laughs> that's great. We've got a couple here. Sure. Um, Chadwick Milledgeville Schools will be having an author illustrator Patricia Palacho yeah. visiting in April. Um, <laughs> and they are very excited about it. Um, and then I've got another one. Um, we are host Donna, Donna, Donna Forbes. Where are you from again? Um, we are hosting a promotion from January 27th to February 15th, date night at the library. Oh, great. Couples are given cards um, with tasks and challenges. If they complete two items from each card, they get coupons and gift cards from local businesses for ice cream cookies, coffee drinks, appetizers, etc. Thank you. She's in Metamora. Okay, great. All right. How about Sycamore? Um, at Ella Johnson, nothing really new going on right now. Okay, thank you. All right, well, there's a lot of good news out there. Great to hear. Um, next member update is April 9th, we think, we think so we will but we will confirm that. News. Yes. So um, I think that's it for the day. Thank you, everybody, for attending. And um, Dee, could you repeat the next date? We think it is what? April 9th, but we will confirm that. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, so long, everyone.